Now this session is one which I'm incredibly pleased that we're pulling off at the beginning of Climate Week rather than at the end of the Climate Week, which is sustainable or just better. For my entire career at Futera, Futera has done work on sustainable lifestyles. I sat on the working group for sustainable living for the United Nations. I've done enormous amounts of research on sustainable lifestyles. And the biggest frustration that I have when we're talking about ways of living and being sustainable is that sustainability is regarded as a sacrifice. That somehow, if we're going to live this sustainable life, it means giving up the things that matter. And when I ask people what matters to you then, what people will say is, well, what matters to me is my family. What matters to me is that I can be a good provider, that I can feed and, and home my family. What matters to me is spending time with my family. What matters to me is, is my stress levels. What matters to me is a good night's sleep. What matters to me is my health and how I look. And you start going, well, I've got a bit of news for you. <laughs> the fact that sustainability is better for all those things. So when people ask me what a sustainable lifestyle is, what sustainable consumption is, I don't talk about the list that's in the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change that where you've got the 20 behaviours that will help reduce climate change. Those are incredibly important. Food, food waste, homes, how we travel, um, how, all our purchasing decisions. Instead, what I talk about is a sustainable lifestyle is one where you get a better night's sleep. A sustainable lifestyle is one where you feel less stressed all the time. A sustainable lifestyle is one where you get more time with your kids. A sustainable lifestyle is one where you feel that you can take a big, deep breath in when you're in the center of a city without coughing. A sustainable lifestyle is one where maybe you've shed a few pounds. A sustainable lifestyle is one where you actually wake up in the morning feeling refreshed. A sustainable lifestyle is feeling better, less stressed, healthier, happier, maybe even having a better sex life. Am I allowed to say that online? <laughs> a sustainable lifestyle should be a better lifestyle. It shouldn't be regarded or sold as a sacrifice because the things which people truly care about, their family, their health, their well-being, are all enabled by a sustainable lifestyle. And somehow it's got into people's heads that it's the other way around. So we've got some incredible people who are able to come today to talk about some of these aspects. We have got the wonderful Ellen from MasterCard. We've got Ian from TikTok. We've got Kristen from GM. And we've got Isaias, who is, a, if you don't follow him on Instagram, please get your phones out. I never ask people to get their phones out in sessions, but get your phones out right now and follow Isaias. Can I ask them to come up and join me here on the panel? Brilliant, thank you so much. And aren't the chairs comfy? Like, like, <laughs> yeah. I, I, like if, if we're going to be talking about sustainable, not just better, I'm like, we want Solutions House to be representing the, the issue. So feel free to like lean back a little bit and like make yourself comfortable. Spin. Um, oh, yeah, and so, although, although apparently I got told I spun too much in the last one and that the video didn't like it. So only a little bit of spinning. So what we're going to do is we're going to come down this line and I'd love you to sort of introduce yourself and your organization and maybe sort of just say a word or two about this opening problem position of sustainable, not just better. And I'm going to come to Ella from Mastercard first. Sure. Well, Solly, thank you to you and the Solutions House for having this session. I, you know, what you just described is a sustainable lifestyle. I mean, who wants to live that lifestyle, right? That sounded absolutely amazing and couldn't be more aligned with the vision that you have for that. So, you know, in MasterCard, why are we talking about this, right? Um, MasterCard is payments technology. You know, we don't really make anything, right? We're, we're the technology system that helps run the economy. We have over 100 million merchants in our network, so 100 million places in the world where all of you can use your MasterCard. We have 20,000 banking partners, and we have over 3 billion cards in circulation. 8 billion people on the planet, 3 billion cards. So Sorry, we, just, just a second. 8 billion people on the planet, and 3 billion of them are your customers. 3 billion cards in circulation. Yeah, and growing, right? So we see a lot of consumption. 
And for us, there's a huge opportunity here as this transition is happening, right? As all of us are starting to make more sustainable choices, as we're working with our merchants to provide more sustainable products and services, there's a huge opportunity for us to help lead the way in this transition, to help support our merchants on this journey, all the way through the cardholders, to work with them to, to desire, to want. And we have a framework for this. I think we'll get into it in a minute. Um, but the, the theory of change, how is MasterCard going to do this? And what's our role in this? So we very intentionally picked these words as part of our sustainable consumption strategy. Inspire, inform, and enable. And that's exactly what MasterCard can do. We can help inspire more sustainable choices, right? Do you actually want what Sally described? How do we create energy and momentum around that? How do we use our really valuable brand, Priceless? You all have probably seen the commercials and um, have heard about MasterCard and Priceless experiences. But how do we evolve what Priceless means to include a sustainable lifestyle? So if you want that, then the next step is inform. How can we help inform you of what is a more sustainable choice? Right? There's a lot of information out there. At times there's greenwashing, there's conflicting uh, levels of granularity to be able to compare products to each other. So we have our first product, the MasterCard Carbon Calculator, which provides information. So after you've made your purchase, you get on your MasterCard you know, bill the amount of the financial expense. But then you also, if you're working with an issuer who provides the calculator that we offer, has an estimated carbon impact, right? Now that's gonna get more granular over time, not perfect just yet. And then we're also working with our merchants because right now it's post-transaction. Wouldn't it be better if you had that information pre-transaction working with our merchants? So more work to do, but you're inspired, you want to do it, you're informed, you know what's a more sustainable choice. And then lastly, enable. How can we create pathways to reduce the friction out of the more sustainable choice? And a great example, uh, those of you moving around New York this week, Hopefully, you're tapping your MasterCard on the subway or tapping your MasterCard on the bus and getting on, right? You don't have to wait in line for a MetroCard where you dig money out of your pocket and put it into the machine or for an ear in London. You don't need an Oyster card. You just tap and get on the tube. Um, so more work for us to do because I live in San Francisco in the Bay Area. You cannot do that there, those of you who are or from there, or Paris, if anyone went to the Olympics, you cannot do that there. So how can we help through our payments technology making it easier uh, to enable that lower friction choice? And I think that's a brilliant example because it's the sort of thing which people didn't even know was a friction for them. And then when it's removed, suddenly it makes the behavior so much easier to do. So absolutely spot on, thank you. Can I come to you, Kristen? Sure. Um, Sustainable lifestyles, is this something that is new to the work you're doing at GM or is this something which has been built in for a while? Oh, I mean, I think it's certainly something that's been built in for a long time, right? I, I love how you broke it down into those segments of wanting, informing, and enabling. I mean, if you think about it, most people want to do the right thing and they want to make a sustainable choice if it's an easy choice to make. And so I think whatever it is, you know, a lot of times we want to have debates over sustainability being in, in conflict maybe with business initiatives where at GM, and I honestly believe it, it almost everywhere, it's really, they're tied together. I mean, I, I often use the example of many of the things that we're trying to do at the very core in our facilities are things that our parents taught us, right? It's, it's turn the lights off. Quit running the water, shut the door, you're letting all the air out of the house, right? And all of those, while they're good for sustainability, they're also good financially. And so whether it be our products, I'm excited Ellen's getting to experience one of our products this week. And um, there's really, as we think about our transition to an all EV future, one of the biggest things is to make sure that we have products that are available and affordable for everyone and that meet customers where they're at and meet their lifestyle needs. So, you know, one of the ones that we're super excited about is the Chevy Equinox EV, which is a family sized SUV, which is the largest segment of vehicles in the US. Um, you know, family, many families only have one vehicle. And that, the Equinox starts at around $35,000 and you pull in the tax credit and now you've got a, a brand new EV with over 300 miles of range at less than 30 grand, which is a pretty exciting opportunity for more people to experience. And you take that into some of the other products and, and I think the exciting thing is seeing 
how the availability across the segments, whether it be the Equinox, the, the Cadillac Lyric, which is an affordable luxury vehicle, our Silverado um, EV pickup truck. There's many people that, again, they use their vehicle for their livelihood, or, or even I'm currently driving the Hummer EV, which is an incredible super truck has some pretty cool features on it. Um, everything from the crab walk, if you haven't seen it, which uh, you can drive in, it has full off-road capability, which I think is the exciting thing. It shows what's really capable in an EV that you can still, you can do everything you always wanted to do in a, you know, in a gas-powered vehicle. Now you can do it in an EV. It also has one of our, our favorite taglines. It has the WTF mode. Which, in case you're wondering, it's watts to freedom. So uh, it's, uh, it's how fast, it, it, it will take off quite quickly. But, you know, it's just, it's exciting to see this transition occur and, and really to show that a sustainable lifestyle is a, is a good lifestyle and there's good things that come with all of that. Thank you so much for that. I was reflecting on the fact that this year is the 15th year of Climate Week. So going back to 2009 was the first Climate Week. And back then, EVs were still a bit of a sideshow. They were still sort of like something that was cute or something that people sort of drove to make a statement. Absolutely was not part of the mainstream. So when people ask me what's changed in those 15 years, EVs is right at the top of my list of things which have just transformed. Yeah, and if you haven't driven an EV, you'll never want to go back. I mean, it is so much fun to drive. The acceleration is instantaneous, and the capability is just incredible. Well, this, this absolutely speaks to the sustainable or just better, which is a lot of the conversations about EVs at the beginning were all about climate, and that's crucial. But the reason why someone buys them is because the things accelerate like they're on rails. Like they're lit exactly. literally extraordinary driving experience, which I think it took us far too long to start telling people. Agree. Azais, you have such a huge following, um, and you have a following around the world, and you have a following from people who live very different lifestyles. And one of the things we want to get to in this conversation is, is it sustainable or expensive? And like, actually, are people being able to opt in to a sustainable lifestyle? Can people afford to be part of a sustainable lifestyle? And you've been very good at talking about the intersexual aspects of being in sustainability. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do and also about how your audience is responding to sort of being a sustainability person? Yeah, I know, absolutely. Um, hello everyone, my name is Isaiah Hernandez. I am an environmentalist and also media creative behind uh, Queer Brown Vegan. And we are a media platform that focuses on intersectional media education. So what we do is work with nonprofits, brands, and institutions to not just understand literacy, but also to expand storytelling. And I'm trained originally as an environmental scientist and worked at you know, corporate, sustainability corporates like TerraCycle and like working with large multinational corporations in my past. And so I think for me, when I talk about sustainability to my community, I root it through a cultural storytelling. So mm -hmm. for me, as an immigrant and someone who grew up in poverty, I saw sustainability as like a dirty thing. I saw it as like, that's not, etiquette that doesn't have any and you know for people that grew up in immigrant households like you've reused the butter jars you've had to like you know look at the cookie jar set and like there's sewing needles you know these are all things that everyone probably can agree on but I think when I got older um, I saw sustainability from a justice perspective and when I mean justice I don't mean like these radical ideas but rather how do we bring it back to the human connections and so for me when I you know look at these products from different industries whether you look at like cleaning, food, um, you know, energy, uh, you know, mobile, automobiles, uh, devices, how do we make it from a sense of one, safety, and two, accessibility, and three, justice? And uh, one really great example of this is like um, how I frame around cleaning products. So like for me, when I talk to immigrant communities around sustainability, it's not so much of like, did you know that this uses X amount and doesn't use slave labor? It's also about, did you know that many people who are cleaning your homes are immigrant parents who are exposed to these toxic mm -hmm. chemicals and they develop respiratory illnesses that is bad. It not just is a health issue, it's a woman's rights issue because many women are employed in this industry. So how do we get to reframe this as a community health and a societal way. And so the ways I really have pushed that narrative is really 
working with brands on a lot of my web series on sustainable jobs to not just expose young people of like the amount of green careers that exist, but the amount of safety that a lot of corporations are taking to ensure that it's not just about the sales, but it's also about the safety component to yeah. ensure that future. I think that's so beautifully put. And one of the things as you speak that occurs to me about Sustainable Just Better is that life that I set the picture out at the beginning, is that something which is available to everybody? So we often talk about if sustainable living is a sacrifice, but if it is a benefit, is everyone going to get access to those benefits? Is everyone going to get access to the benefits of living a sustainable life? And I think it's very interesting in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their ARC support, they did a comparison between what we need to do to live sustainably from a demand side, which is a sustainable lifestyle, and the rest of the SDGs. And they showed how living a sustainable lifestyle helps to deliver all the rest of the SDGs if it's done in a way that's equitable and everyone around the world gets access to it. So I absolutely fantastic points there. Coming to Ian. So Ian, TikTok. Are you a TikToker? I am a user, yes. You're a user, yeah. yeah. Am I a creator? No, we leave that to the professionals. <laughs> yeah. Um, so TikTok, um, uh, what, uh, much like MasterCard, a platform with a huge reach, massive number of users, and you know, massive conversation about consumption and lifestyle, which matter deeply to people on it. Well, how can TikTok use that reach? Yeah, and we, I mean, we're incredibly lucky that we have a billion people who use our platform on a monthly basis. And I understand usually that's quite impressive, but <laughs> three billion is, uh, yeah, we're working on it. But I think f for us, yeah, we understand our reach, we understand our, our influence, we understand the opportunity that we have. So what we really try and do is tap into three different elements within, within our world, so to speak, to try and drive positive impact. So number one is around our product. How can we actually make, op optimize and make our product better? How can we start to do the things to make our product deliver on the impact and the value we're trying to see in society? Number two is our partnerships. How can we partner with the right organizations and, and the right people to start actually getting the right messages out to the world? And one, one, one example I'll talk about is some of our uh, misinformation partnerships we're doing with the UN. How can we actually get trusted messengers, whether that's scientists or whether that's academics, how can we get their message out to these billion people around the world? And then number three is our creators. They are the people who engage with the audience and with the world. We as a company, we don't talk to these billion people. These are our superstars, our, our creators who, who have that platform and that voice. So what we're really trying to do is how can we take some of our creators on this journey? How can we start to get them to be the messengers and them to be the champions of these sustainable lifestyles that we need to be living? And, and one of the things we're working on is how can we train our creators? How can we actually take our creators from a point of, right, we are talking about these issues and, and we're seeing them play well in app. And, and by that, I mean, we have all the data. We see that everything you were saying earlier, Solly, those types of things perform really well. So if a creator is saying, right, I want to make somebody have a sustainable action, you should do X, Y, or Z to, to make the world a better place. That performs very badly. We don't get video views, we don't get engagement. We actually have the data to show that when you talk about the functional, social, emotional benefits, stealing from some Futera work there, but when you, when you take and, and put those benefits at front and, and center, we see those videos perform really well. We see the number of video views skyrocket. We see the engagements and the impressions skyrocket. And we also see the actions follow, and, and we're doing a lot of work on measuring creator sentiment and measuring the actual impact of these things going forward. And that's where we're starting to see the difference. So it's really about how can we change the way that our creators are talking about these topics and lean into exactly, exactly what you said. I think that's fascinating that there's the actual data yeah. that many of us will have experienced ourselves in our own lives, that when we're sitting there making the scientific case or the moral case for sustainability, even though maybe that was what motivated us to get involved as sustainability people, that that's not what's getting the views or the responses. Like that's hard data. That's not just what people say in a survey. That's that I'm not clicking on it. If it's yeah. going to be moralistic, I yeah. am clicking on it. If it's talking about these yeah. benefits, these um, social, um, uh, emotional, and functional benefits. And of course, the best bit being is there are 
are loads of social, um, uh, uh, emotional and functional benefits. Now, I'm going to come back, um, Ellen, to you and go, there are barriers, though, as well. There are benefits and there are barriers to what people can do, how they can, how they can act on a sustainable lifestyle. And by the way, at this point, actually, I'm just going to take a slight segue. At this point, I, I haven't got any questions online about it, but somebody there is itching to go, but it's not about sustainable lifestyles. It's about systemic change at the top. So I just want to, just want to put that. Of course it bloody is. <laughs> it's like, of course we need mass systemic change. Of course we need policy change. Of course we need to hold companies to account yeah. for what you're doing and your footprints. That's what most of Climate Week is there to talk about, about the powerful people and how we create create that change. But people power, what we as individuals can do, matters too. And maybe the carbon numbers are different on that, but I absolutely hate the message that individuals have no power in this, that individuals are nothing except sort of passive parts of the system, that the only people who get to act on sustainability are powerful people with all of the issues around privilege and race that come with that. Actually, if we look at some of the major changes that have happened in society, particularly things around food and around transport, they were driven by consumer choice. When we look at some of the impacts that happen in society and that are likely to happen next, we need the demand side signals around that. And the IPCC and others have recognized that. So I am happy to talk to anybody about that. But the fact that when you're talking about sustainable lifestyles, that there's the implication that means you don't care about structural or systemic change is incredibly annoying. It's an either or conversation rather than what it should be, which is a both conversation. And I, for one, don't want to be told that in my own life I have zero power and yeah. ev everything is simply in the gift of politicians and CEOs. I don't think that's true. I believe that we as individuals have power and that's the conversation we're having today. So I'm more than happy to have that, but as you can tell, I'm quite energised by it. <laughs> so for the sake of this conversation, we're staying within the realms of sustainable lifestyles, of living better and what consumers can do, and then at another Another time on the very next panel, we can hold corporates to account for what they're doing. But I'm not going to um, be distracted by that. It's such an important conversation. So, sorry, I should have said that at the beginning. And if you want to have an argument with me about it, please do, because I've had many, many, many of them. Um, so, back to barriers and benefits. So, Ellen, feel free to comment on that. Or, um, uh, what, what, we, what I'd love is anything that you want to share around this equity issue of this perception that living sustainably might be more expensive, that living sustainability isn't something that everybody around the world gets, gets access to. And if there's anything that you can share from what MasterCard is doing with those three billion people, many of whom do not live in Europe or the United States, around enabling a, a sustainable lifestyle. Yeah, well, so since you brought up the other topic, I'm going to talk about that for just a little second, and then I'll get to the second part of the, the question. But so back to like individual action, how do we at MasterCard think about individual action and corporate responsibility? And so one of the things the company did a couple years ago was change our compensation system. So all 30,000 plus employees at MasterCard are compensated on our progress against our ESG goals, including carbon reduction, financial inclusion, gender pay parity, um, and so on. And, and so by doing that, right, we're setting up incentives where the individuals, everybody, someone was asking me, um, Ian, right, we were talking about how big is the sustainability team at MasterCard compared to TikTok? Well, it's 30,000 plus people, everybody's compensated on it, it's their responsibility, it's part, it needs to be part of their job. So we could talk about that. That's great behavior change though, that's an example, that's a, ben that's a, that's a benefit that helps people in, inside the company, because we too often talk about behavior change in terms of consumer and not in terms of ourselves or our colleagues. Yeah, and so then to the second part of the question in terms of kind of equity in, yeah. in lifestyles and choices, um, we have a couple of examples of how we're thinking about this. First, I'll just mention MasterCard's known for our Center for Inclusive Growth. It was established about a decade ago, a leading company, you know, in terms of building capability around financial inclusion and inclusive growth. And one of the things that I love about MasterCard is 
when you bring financial inclusion to a community that's been unbanked, you're also, and maybe it's not intentional, but it is a positive, uh, unintended consequence perhaps, um, you're also preparing that community to be more resilient and to be able to better adapt to the forces of climate change. So there's a direct connection, uh, and we were using some examples yesterday of small businesses, for example, um, that are functioning in communities where there's an extreme weather event. And the MasterCard Economics Institute just came out with research that showed, along with the World Bank, um, in those communities, right, they're not just hit economically during the day, the moment the hurricane hits, right? It's about nine days before, up to 16 days after, so almost a month, right? And for those small businesses, or any business that's functioning in that community, you see, and if they're brick and mortar only, you see a contraction in their business by about 50%. Now, if that business has an online presence and is connected to the digital economy, that contraction reduces to about 20%, right? So the power of being financially included and being able to be much more resilient and able to adapt, I mean, there's, there's clear connection between everything our company's been doing around financial inclusion, um, as well as climate adaptation and, and resilience. So really excited about, about those things. Brilliant, thank you. Kristen, um, you talked about sort of being a, people being able to price themselves into EVs. And of course, we're talking about a global transformation of the entire transport system. Like, do you, how long is the tail going to be until, pe until we get to that EV future? Well, I mean, we'd like it to happen as fast as it possibly can. Um, we can't do it on our own, though. I mean, we've set some big goals around it. We have a goal to be 100% EV and light duty, new light duty US vehicles by 2035. Um, but we've got a ways to go, and, and that transition isn't going to be linear. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of discussion over is this transition slowing down. You know, I think everyone expected that it was just going to continue on this exponential pace, and that's not the reality. Part of that is having options for customers to transition to. Um, part of it is about you know how communities accept and make the transition, whether it be EV infrastructure. Um, you know, one of the things we're really proud of is as we make this transition within our own facilities that we were staying in the communities where we were. We want to be a good neighbor. It's important to us on, on how we support the communities where we live and work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, GM's really driving innovation, job creation, and American competitiveness on this transition to an all EV future. And so the product portfolio is going to be a big piece of that. Um, making sure that it's affordable, that it meets the needs of the customers and the, con and the consumers, and then that the infrastructure and policy, and, and we work together, whether it be across industry or, or public and communities, to really make that transition a reality for everyone. That's brilliant, thank you. Can I try this? In terms of that aspect of equity to a sustainable lifestyle, have you seen partnerships work well around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, being able to work with so many different brands from different industries, and I always tell people, the vegan does not limit me, it actually expands me <laughs> in different ways. But I think with, when I talk to different brands and their missions, I think um, when it comes to equity, I always look at one, ESG, but two, like I mentioned from the other panelists, like what programs and initiatives are being developed. I think for me, obviously, um, from a labor perspective, everyone having more than minimum wage, having a fair wage is something I always look at. And I think that younger consumers today are very political where we're saying, Brands can no longer be apolitical, they must be political. And being political is recognizing the amount of investments that's going into, whether that's the corporation going into programs to help for education or, um, you know, girls in STEM and science or like other, um, you know, LGBT rights. You know, for me, that's something that I think um, it's hard for brands to communicate that because we could see sometimes of the backlash that they can receive. Mm -hmm. But I think when I approach these brands and they approach me to work with them, we kind of say like, how do we create a story out of this? And that story comes from a lot of personalized experiences for myself and how I see the world. And I think when audiences, you know, see these partnerships, they're not seeing it as like, this is greenwashing, but rather a more nuanced discussion of like, yes, we can validate that these are some of the issues or the, the systems that the industry has been built on top of and needs to 
phase out, but then at the same time, these are the other extensions that are growing out of this. And I, I really invite a lot of brands here um, that work for corporates to not just hire Gen Z as like consultants, but also be able to do that storytelling because I think traditionally a lot of brands hire these agencies to produce these campaigns, but then they don't really make sense to what we're talking about in our current generation. And I think um, this is where that collaboration comes, especially people from different backgrounds to be able to shape that campaign and to shape how we're talking about equity versus it's just a checklist to just mention it on the ad that we give back 1% of our profits to this group. Like yeah. we want to have a deeper conversation and that's followed up through events and having, um, you know, these curated discussions that talk about it. So I think it's fascinating in terms of a sustainable lifestyle, the media landscape that we live in now, that there are so few gatekeepers that people can talk about their lifestyles to, to whoever they want through platforms like TikTok. Great segue there. I was yeah. really pleased with that one. Um, uh, in some of this, some of this about making this sustainable lifestyle conversation something which you don't have to be a sort of deep green person or already interested in these topics. Like, I honestly think we have reached every deep green person on the planet. Yeah. We've got them all. We've recruited every single one. They are already in. They are either at Climate Week or wish they were. They are following along. They don't need our help. The vast majority of people who are motivated by the same things we're motivated by or the same things I'm motivated, they're already in. And we're not going to go out there and convert the rest of the world to having the same set of values or perceptions that perhaps we do. How do we reach folks who are watching loads of fashion videos or watching loads of makeup videos to bring them into the fact that a sustainable lifestyle is better for them? I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, yeah, I just want to plus one that. I, it's, it's what we're trying to work on. That's I think, love it. For me, the, there's kind of three areas that we work on in this topic. So the number one is how can we drive as much quantity of these conversations in app? So last year, we had about 100 billion video views of climate-related topics. Can you say that number again? 100 billion video Million view. or billion? B, billion. Billion. 100 billion, billion views video. of climate-related topics. And so, Whoa. obviously, there's not that many people in the world, number one, right? But there's also not that many people in the world who are already deep greens, as you say, and are already talking about this. So number one, we're already reaching and touching some of those people. So, so number one for us is, how can we drive more of these conversations? Number two is how can we drive a better quality of these conversations? So yes, we're having 100 billion video views, but how can we increase the quality of that conversation? And I think this is, this is exactly what you were saying, Solly, of right, what we need to be doing is we need to be working with some of our creators, we need to be educating them. But crucially, who should we be working with and educating them? It's, it's not about how do we get our sustainability creators, mm -hmm. because these creators are talking to an echo chamber. They have a much smaller reach and a smaller following, mm -hmm. but they're already talking to these already converted people who understand the problem, who understand the solutions, who are already doing this. So for us, it's really about how do we work with what we call our lifestyle and education creators. So these are our mainstream creators in food, fashion, travel, sports, humanities, whatever. And one of the things we do with them is, is we take them to big global events. Mm -hmm. So at COP last year, we took six of our biggest fashion creators and sport creators to COP and we put them down in front of some of the chief scientists. And them, they have this ability to translate these complex, hard to understand conversations. And they have the rigor coming from the scientist and you have the reach from these creators. And they translate it into ways that they can understand, which is ways that their audience can also understand. So that's the second one, the quality of conversation. And then the third one for us is around misinformation. We know that misinformation is a huge topic when it comes to sustainability and to the environment and working out how we can proactively tackle misinformation. And again, I, I mentioned this UN campaign that we're working on, this partnership we're working on around highlighting and proactively tackling misinformation. And one of the things I've loved about that campaign is we look for what we call trusted messengers in each of the markets we're doing this in. And in some markets, that is a scientist. In some markets, that's a religious leader. In some markets, that's a community leader. In some markets, it's, it's an academic. And really identifying who are those people who have that story to tell, where it's authoritative information, that then they will be trusted. Mm. And making sure that their message is heard, that we can get that out to as many people as possible. Mm. So through those three kind of levers, 
we're really trying to, to drive those conversations and our aim is to reach as many people as possible with that. Brilliant. And disinformation and sustainable lifestyles, these, these, are, these are two issues that need to be tackled at the same time. I'm going to come to some questions from the audience. Um, and we've got one I always want to acknowledge and thank our online audience. So I'm going to come to the first question, um, which is which has come from our online uh, uh, watchers. Which is, we're talking about consumers here. Some people do not like the term consumers. They like the term people and what have you. And I try to do that, and then I always default back to consumers, because otherwise nobody else in corporate world know what I'm talking about. So um, uh, that's a behavior change on my part. But of course, we're not a monolith. All of us in this room are consumers. Every single person here buys, participates, eats, drinks. Um, and we have very different approaches, beliefs, lifestyles, cultures. Um, does anyone want to say a word around how do we make sure that this isn't a monolith and that we're not assuming that one sustainable lifestyle is the only sustainable lifestyle? Maybe the pitch that I shared at the beginning was not something which every different cultural perspective, age or demographic would be interested in. So is there anything that we can do to make sure that we're being really inclusive of the, of the massive, wondrous, beautiful diversity of human lifestyles and that we're reflecting that in the work that we do? And th this is, I'm now not pointing at you. This is now, this is now open questions. Like the rules are gone. You, ca you can speak if you wish. Yeah, so I might just say, you know, the title that you chose here, sustainable or just better, and you said it a little bit earlier, it's, it's not an or, it's an and. And I think that's the way we need to think about this, right? Just like, you know, the example that I was using on the subway. You tap and you go into the turnstile and you get on and you take your ride to wherever you're going. It's better, right? You don't have to wait. You don't have to carry and remember another piece of paper. It's faster, all these things. Uh, and it's, it's typically low cost, right? It's a low cost way of doing this. And it's sustainable. And so I think when you're thinking about all of the options that are out there of how we find these solutions, right? Uh, answers only. That there are so many different answers to the questions. There are so many different ways to do the how that can be sustainable and just better. So I, I do think we have to be very open-minded here and take lessons from you know, a variety of diverse voices, cultures, communities. And typically, as, as we know, right, the best answers come from the people living it daily, right? They're the experts. And back to you know, how we're thinking about all of our employees inside MasterCard. So I mentioned the compensation modifier, right? You're now all compensated on whether or not we make progress towards our goals. Well, how does an employee, you know, a, a employee in marketing, you know, kind of sitting in their team, how are they connected to this? Or what about somebody in finance, procurement, or a product design, or whatever it is? They know the best answer for how to turn their job into a more sustainable job that's also delivering on the value creation that we need to bring as MasterCard, because we're a growth company. Uh, so I do think it's, it's really about putting the, the power, empowering um, those communities, those people, the people in your company, to come up with the best, most sustainable solutions that are sustainable and better. Donna, Ellen, that's such a better title for this session. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wish we'd come up with that before, sustainable and just better. Anyone um, else want to speak? I, with yeah, I mean, I would just add to, I think, what you both said. And, and I, I think your point over the fact that we have the passionate folks. We, we have the climate activists. We have those that are, you know, live and breathe this every day. But it really is about meeting people where they're at and helping them understand how the choices they're making can be more sustainable and better. You know, and better for them, better for, you know, financially. There's, there's lots of examples that we can use, and some are small and some are big. I mean, I talked about the portfolio of vehicles, but even in our facilities, the sustainable solutions are, are better, right? They're, they're more efficient, they're cheaper, they're, and there's so many different things and analogies that can, you can make. You talked about everything, you know, in our business, it's, how does the design engineer choose the more sustainable material? You know, we recently launched a, um, a or have a, a, um, a prototype vehicle out there with a replacement for leather. And when we did a, I'll say, blind test on it, and it's made with a company called MycoWorks um, using mycinium, which is an alternative using mushrooms, mm -hmm. you know, to create a leather alternative. But when you put them side by side, it felt better. 
it was softer, it was cheaper, right? I, I mean, all of those things. So it was, it was better yeah. in many, many ways. And so we've got to keep looking. And, and I think it really is important to meet people where they're, they're at and help them understand how the choices they can make can be more sustainable. Such a great point. I saw you look like you were ready to jump. No, no, no. <laughs> ready to fly out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I, I think we should, yeah, I think my theory of change has always been like reimagine interrogation to education because I think from an educator perspective, like, you know, we always hear the phrase of like, you're not an environmentalist if X, Y, Z. Like, you're not an environmentalist if you eat meat. You're not an environmentalist if you use a car. If you're not an environmentalist if you fly. And, you know, these types of binary messaging can sometimes really hold us down. And I think for me, my platform is really more about providing a holistic lifestyle while acknowledging like the people who follow me, they come from different backgrounds. And like, I think if we focus so much on the title around sustainability lifestyle, we lose those embodiments of what we're actually practicing. And so I think, you know, for me, I, I share this story where, you know, um, fun fact, I got my license this year, um, 28, and I failed. I got a car for you. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I, I had posted in my community, I was like, I can't wait to search for my first car. Yeah. And I got ripped online just because I shared that I wanted to get a car. And I just said, well, I've taken public transportation, I've Ubered, but you know, these are cases where I think about it from a safety and accessibility side where, you know, I'm having to drive my parents sometimes to their hospital visits or mm -hmm. I have to be there for my siblings. And so, like, for me, I think, like, I think of it a way of, like, we live in a society that is time poverty. We don't have enough time to do the things that we want to do. And it's even worse for single parents or parents or people that have to play different roles up top of the career that they have. And so I think when we, we discuss these nuances and these discussions, I think we can actually have more of a flourishing future rather than a more constructive way of seeing this of like, you're a bad person for flying to New York City yeah. during climate week. Yeah. Very much true. Do you mind, Ian, if we actually go to a few more co Please questions from the audience? Um, uh, pop your hand up if you have a question. And Fred is the man with the mic. There, oh, well, there is a question right there. Hi, guys. My name is Kylie Onserio. And could, you, like, could you hold your mic a little bit closer? Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm Kylie Onserio. This is like an open-ended question. But one question I had when you guys were speaking was, we all know that humans don't like to change things that they're accustomed to, like routine, habits, like I even buy the same toothpaste. Uh, what do you, like it's such a simple thing, but how do you get people to make these changes? Because it's one thing to see it. Hmm. Maybe like people can post about it so they can feel like they're doing something, but at the end of the day, if it's only like instantaneous for that moment, it's fleeting, like, you know, so how do you go about that? Thank you so much. That's such a great question because we're talking about sustainable lifestyle here as if making change was easy. Whereas anyone who has ever tried to change anything about their life knows how incredibly difficult it is. So actually, I think that's a great question to end on, which is how do we make making these changes easier for people? Because even if you've got the best will in the world, changing your habits is hard. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I think it's something we often struggle with where one of our biggest success metrics with content is how many people have watched that piece of content. That doesn't necessarily mean how many people have changed their life because mm -hmm. of their content, and they're two completely different things. And we struggle with that a lot, where we do a big campaign and we get 800 million video views. And you go, but, but what has the impact been? What has the change been? And I think that's something that, that we're, we haven't figured out yet, but, but, but we're working on. Mm -hmm. And it always comes back to me for the question of like, our role, what is our role? Our role is to basically to demystify and to, to democratize these complex conversations. And that's kind of the tagline we've started to use internally. It's about how can we give people the information to let them make the best choice for themselves. I don't want to be choosing for everyone because that is not how the world we should be living in. And so, like, no individual should be choosing for someone else. But what we're really trying to do is give people the right information. Mm -hmm. And one of the best things, a bit biased here, but one of the best things about TikTok is that actually you can get information from people who think like you, who live in your local area, who live a similar lifestyle to you, who can then be able to give you that tip, those tips and tricks. And, mm -hmm. They're not telling you to do things, but hopefully it's, a, it's something that you can do to make your life better. 
And I think that's one of the powers of social media because unlike a TV show or an advert, which I might see once, telling me to do it, I am very dedicated to the people that I follow. Like, yeah. they are my friends. <laughs> like, they don't know I exist, but they are my friends. <laughs> actually, I followed Isaiah before I cut, started inviting him to things, so now I can get claim he's my friend. And actually, that repetition, yeah. because actually seeing something once doesn't work, but one of the advantages to social media is maybe the fourth or the tenth or the twelfth time that I see something, it actually helps me make that change. So that's how do you help the folks that, that follow you make their decisions, make their choices, make their change? Yeah, I think from a storytelling perspective, I feel like if you ask the general person, like, what did you do growing up as your lifestyle? You'll find out that most of the time they just grew up sustainable. And I feel like when I share about like, oh yeah, I used to do this as a kid and I share my story, people are like, you know, because of your story, it just reminded me that I used to do that as a kid. Now I'm going to start doing it again and practicing it. So I feel like it's not so much like teaching them new things anymore. It's more like reconnecting them to those older memories about their parents. And like, I think when you frame it from like, oh, my mom used to do that. Oh, my sister, used to, brother used to do that. Then they're more inclined to be like, you know what? Like, I want to practice this to honor them too. I think that's an awesome way of saying it. This isn't about a new lifestyle. This is actually about honoring away. My dad would love that because he was so about turning the lights off. Mm. It's like, <laughs> I, I, need to, I need to honor my dad with the turning the lights off. Listen. Yeah, I, it, when you asked the question, it made me think of a conversation I had recently with a, a peer, and we were talking about change, and she made a statement that was so powerful to me. She said, you know, it's not that people don't like change, but people don't like change that they perceive is going to negatively impact them. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, yeah, of course, but you don't think about it that way. We always think of change as a bad thing, but if I tell you you're getting a raise or a new job or a new house tomorrow, that's change that you're all in, right? And so I think we, it goes back to the conversation, how do we educate and help people understand that this change is good and it's good for them. It's not just good for others, but it's a good impact for them and it is better. And so I, I think it's kind of how we've been talking all day here. Love it. Ellen. So I'm going to go back to our theory of change around driving sustainable consumption across that massive network that I described. Inspire, inform, and enable. How can we inspire? We just used one of our biggest sponsorship platforms, the Grammys, earlier this year. We partnered with SZA, right, the most Grammy-nominated artist. She dropped a new song, Saturn. If you've watched her video, it's filmed in a forest. She's wearing a dress that has seeds sewn all over the dress that Conservation International, our Priceless Planet Coalition partner, helped us pick out so that when they were mailed all over um, the world to her fans who want access to those seeds in a special eco package with a sign frame photo. Um, you know, they, were, they were the right kind of seeds to be planting. Anyway, we were leveraging the power of this incredible influencer, right, who has millions and millions of fans. And what was so interesting is like the numbers, right, our marketing team, this was a big bet we made with marketing teams. Some of our marketing representatives are here tonight. Um, but people like love this. The fans loved it. We activated with um, Lyft during the time of the Grammys. So if you took a Lyft ride, if anybody happened to take a Lyft ride in February in the United States, um, I saw it myself randomly one day while you're waiting for your car for two minutes. It says your car's arriving in two minutes. SZA pops up and tells you, hey, this ride today is going to restore a tree as part of the Priceless Planet Coalition. Huh, okay. If you signed up for Sirius XM and paid with your MasterCard, it said, hey, you know, your new subscription is going to restore one tree. So we're leveraging the power of influencers like SZA, and Ian and I have discussed, we've got a lot to talk about, <laughs> yes, yes, how, how we can, you know, leverage this inspiration campaign for sustainable consumption. We're informing people of what's more sustainable, and we're enabling them so it is just better, right? And that's our theory. We're still, you know, trying to measure, did SZA act? actually change people's behaviors. To Sally's point, it's probably going to take SZA and you know, a million other artists that we're going to eventually work with and other companies who are going to hop on board with this theory of change of inspire, inform, and enable. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. As you've been seeing me, I've been reflecting on my younger sister. My younger sister has some disabilities, and she has decided to live her life in an entirely sustainable way. She doesn't travel. She d takes public transport only. She's vegan. She grows her own food. All of her things are thrifted. She's 100% zero waste, which sometimes involves her calling me to ask what to do about the various things that she wants to change. And uh, she has chickens, and she, um, uh, uh, her and her family live this incredible sustainable life which is completely right for them and would be completely wrong for me. Mm. 
that I live my sustainable life involves being an advocate for sustainability. I travel, I, 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 I dress in a certain way, I live my life. And actually, between the two of us, I have enormous respect for the way that she lives her life, and I learn a great deal about the barriers and benefits to living that sustainable life. And she is enormously grateful for the work that I do to try to advocate for change in a more international way. And what we both live is the life that we want the lifestyle that we want. And I think that's one of the things which really this comes down to, that a sustainable life can be the life that you want. And you can live that sustainable life in very, very, very different ways. There is not one single way to do it, as long as it's better, and I so wish we'd, we'd call this sustainable and better, rather than <laughs> sustainable or better, but as long as it's just better. So thank you so much for joining us at this session. Thank you so much for the many people that I see have joined us online. Um, there is some tea and coffee, and, uh, uh, and I hope that you stay and continue the conversation afterwards. Please join me in thanking Ian and Isaiah and Kristen and Ellen.